So we're back in 1994 and the internet was coming up. It was all dial up modems. It was extremely slow, pain in the valley, ADSL they didn't come up with. And then somebody comes up with voice of IP. They always come up with voice of IP. They tried all these impossible things and you were one of them. But you created a billion dollar company out of it. How, how, walk us through that process. How did that start? It was one of your crazy ideas which you had at that time? Yes. So first, you discovered the internet first. First, no one would believe you because everybody thinks that uh, Skype or uh, some other company invest, invented voice over IP. But all these companies that people use today, WhatsApp, Skype, and so on, were created in 2000, 2002, 2003. So we're talking about 10 years before, right? When you say, like you say, when, when the entire internet was a dial-up internet. So I was actually in the voicemail business. So I, I, I used to make, I, I made the first PC voicemail system because before that it were all proprietary and so on. So we had a PC, we had uh, cards, we had phone interface already, and we could record you just like we're recording this. We could take a message, record, route the call, and so on. So we had all the functionality. Yeah, and all these cards you bought in Taiwan or something, they made all these uh, incredible things. A company here in the US called Dialogic. Dialogic made voice cards, mm -hmm. and there were 16-bit or 8-bit cards that went right into the back plane. And uh, uh, and then I said, well, you know, like I started seeing internet uh, 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 cables become available because I did a project with AT&T and a few other things. And I said, wait a second, what if I take my voicemail system, I put a card in there, a, a network card, mm -hmm. and I put a DSP card, and instead of recording it to the hard drive, recording the system to the hard drive, I'm just going to push all of that messaging into a DSP card that's going to push it on the TCP IP network. Now, there was a company called Vocal Tech in, out of Israel that did this on Ethernet. But no one did it on TCP IP. On Ethernet, it's easy because you have a LAN, you have your own network, you have unlimited bandwidth, you never have delays, you never have any issues, right? And people did it on, on uh, there were several protocols. There was VT1 protocol, VT2. There was a uh, uh, frame relay protocol. So people did voice over all those things, voice over frame relay, voice over ethernet. When you said voice over IP, people were like, IP? IP is dial up modems. Yeah. No, you will, it, you need 20, 26 you know, like kilobit just to do voice. Yeah. And WhatsApp, for example, is using uncompressed 64 kilobits, yeah. right? So, so it was all 14K4 and 14K it was- 14K came in 97, 98. Okay. We're talking about 1200 oh, board wow. modems. <laughs> So you needed 10 times or 20 times the capacity yeah. just to put one single voice communication. So because of that, no one thought that that was possible. So that's why everybody focused on high bandwidth protocols, including ATM. There were voice over ATM services available. But I believe that the internet, that the TCP IP and UDP are going to be the winning protocols. And I wrote a patent about it, October 5th, 1994 which is my birth date. Uh, uh, so it was, it was, and you know, you can find the patent on my website, machinsky.com. I built the first gateway. I put two machines together with a TCP IP network and I w went to AT&T and I showed it to them. And but you had to compress it really. I mean, what kind of algorithms yeah, did you have to compress? The DSP, so the DSP basically used, uh, created the compression. So we, we did basically eight to one compression on the which lost a lot of the quality of the voice yes. now but phones are shitty anyway and the problem was the processing power so you just didn't have enough processing power and this was just when we went from a 286 processor to a 386 processor and 386 processor also gave you 10 times the memory mm -hmm. so now you could do compression and memory and between the dsp the ability to basically process everything in DSP, then compress it with the CPU and use memory-based processing instead of uh, hard drive-based processing. Oh, yeah. I had just enough to do one channel. <laughs> so each computer did one channel, believe it or not. And on the back end, I needed 16 or 16.4 kilobit throughput to be able to run it through on the back backbone of the internet. So. So I came to, I, I started showing it to people, right? I had my patent. I didn't get it, I just filed for it. But I had a pet patent pending. I had a gateway. Sounds good, patent padding. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and... and uh, Did you get it in the end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It took 10 years, but I got it. You caught a patent for voice over IP over TCP IP? Yes. 
That's a pattern. It's just like click here to buy. I mean, it's really a ridiculous pattern. It's not ridiculous because all these steps I just described are unique steps that no one has done before. So uh, click to buy is uh, not a very complicated uh, pattern. But here you had very, very, you had like six or seven steps on one side, and then you had to do the same thing on the other side because the devices, all the devices, unlike our phones today, which support TCP IP natively, all the devices were either analog or, or they were TDM based. So you had to go from TDM to IP and then back from IP to TDM, right? And that's what my pattern is about is about doing the conversions on both sides. So, so uh, luckily enough for me, you know, it's all about timing, right? Uh, unbeknownst to me at all, uh, this, uh, the State Department, right? The U.S. State Department. Oh, this is a great story, yeah. Yes. Uh, was, had this huge fight with foreign countries, just like we have a fight right now with China. Yeah, about postal, postal. About international trade. Yeah. They had a fight with, the, with the KPN. They had a fight with the Germans, with, with Deutsche Telekom and everybody, because basically for every country in the world, it was much cheaper to call from the United States to Holland than it was to call from Holland to the United States. And uh, when, when the KPN settled with AT&T, which were the two major carriers, AT&T always owed money to KPN, always owed money to KDD or to, to Deutsche Telekom or anybody else. So the U.S. back then was paying something like $6 billion a year, outflowing. Money was just coming out of the United States because of this imbalance, just because the foreign carriers were charging much more for the same phone calls in the United States. Extremely unfair. Right. So, so the funny thing is that AT&T that the State Department went to AT&T and said, solve the problem. We don't care how. You guys are the phone company. You figure out how to balance, eliminate this imbalance in uh, trade, which is exactly what we're doing right now with China and with a few other countries where we have imbalance of trade of $600 billion. Just back there, the number was $6 billion. So AT&T went to Bell Labs and which was their uh, R&D organization. I think it has 26, back then it had like something like 26,000 employees, right? All PhDs and Nobel Prize winners and you name it, right? And, and tasks them with a, a, a solution that will eliminate this problem. And of course, they came up with these gigantic systems that required either ATM circuits or frame relay or gigantic circuits They were just not available, right? And here comes Alex Mashinsky and says, hey, I can do it on a tiny little circuit. I can do it on a circuit one-tenth the size of what Bell Labs is asking for. And uh, What was your idea? To have a whole rack of PCs and basically to, to go through uh, TCP IP because it was cheaper than, than having the phone? Uh, the phone uh, yeah, but so, so this was a way to bypass the system. So instead of, you see, like AT&T and KD... And you could avoid KPN. Yeah, you could exactly. avoid using KPN. They could go directly to other people down the line. Exactly. Because AT&T and KPN had an undersea cable, and they shared it half and half. They owned it half and half. And if you put circuits, if you put transactions through that cable, the settlement was based on whatever the price was. But if you could go around that cable in any way, then the settlement had nothing to do with it. You were going around the settlement. So, so it's not that voice over IP was invented and suddenly everybody picked up their phone and started calling voice over IP. In the beginning, it was a way to get around the settlement systems, right? And, and the funny thing was... Avoid the big monopoly of all the incumbents yeah, in, the, in the country. This was a global problem. This was a global problem. It was every country in the world and so on. And so my company was, I think, six employees. I mean, we were a tiny little company. For AT&T to give us this giant project was crazy, right? I mean, it was like, so, and I remember... Like I, IBM using uh, Microsoft for their operating system for the PC. Exactly, and, and so I remember they called us for a meeting in, in uh, um, whatever, the headquarters of AT&T in New Jersey. I forgot the name of the... It's next to the uh, Bell Labs facilities. And um, I uh, ordered a stretch limo because I didn't have, I wanted to bring in more people. So I ordered a stretch limo and I told e every one of my employees, bring another friend because we're going to need to go to AT&T and pretend like we're a giant company. So we filled up the limo. I think we had like 11 people. Half of them are not employees of, of Arbonet. 
and we take this long ride in, in a stretch to, to um, I can't believe I don't remember the name, but anyway, and we show up, and of course, they have a giant conference room, and at t has like 20 people, you know, like sitting there. And uh, anyway, we start talking and this and that, and, and I said, let me demonstrate. Let me demonstrate a VoIP call. And, I'm, and, I, and I was trying to call my system to show it. And they're like, you can't get out of the conference room. You need a special code. I'm like, oh, yeah? And I, ha I put a special code that I knew that will get around any PBX and will give you an outside line. Oh, really? Just like back in the day. <laughs> like ap Apple and uh, the blue box uh, from. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So back in the day, you, to get outside line, you just dialed nine or eight. Yeah. But in AT&T, you needed a special code. But most PBXs used to have like a five digit code that will allow a test system. So I just knew those codes. Yeah. And that impressed them more than any technology that I introduced. The fact that I could hack the AT&T PBX inside their headquarters and get an outside line and dial my VoIP system and then get a phone call on the, on the phone next to me was for them was like magic. They said, if you can do that, we trust you, you can do anything you want. So, so they gave us this tiny little project of basically putting a gateway in the US, putting a gateway in Japan. That was our first launch country because they, they already had facilities in, in Tokyo uh, with a company called ATT Gens. So there was an AT&T subsidiary that provided corporate services. So if you could get phone calls there, they could basically put it on the Japanese network. Right, but that, that company had a 45 megabit circuit of internet, which was huge. I mean, that like Stanford at the time, their entire circuit was 4,500, uh, 45 megabit, right? Yeah, yeah. To, and this was all the way to Japan, exactly. So, because they were the internet service provider for Japan. And they basically told us, you know, that circuit is maybe 50% utilized, you need 16K or multiples of 16K, no problem. We can give you that all day long, okay? Set up your box there, set up your box here, show us that it works, we don't believe you. And then all of our customers can dial a local number either in Japan or a local number in the US and it will ring on the other side transparently, right? Without any delays. And that's what all the patents are about. How do you do that w when you hop from one network to another without having to do anything? You still dial the regular number, the system intercepts the call and routes it over IP. Because when you dial on your phone, you still dial a regular number, right? That was, very, that was, that was key. Yes. So, and luckily for us, uh, um, Dialogic just at the right time came up with a T1 line. So instead of connecting analog uh, RJ11 jacks, now you could connect a full T1, which... Wow. Yeah. One megabit or something? Or, uh, right, it's, it's, it's uh, 24 circuits of 64 uh, kilobit each, right? So it's... And, and uh, one of them is a control circuit, blah, 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 but anyway. But the point is that you had, now you could do 23 sil simultaneous calls in one computer. And, and again, we, a few months later, we got a 486, so we, had, we could actually run, uh, we had enough processing power to do all of that, and we had a plug from AT&T, and we had a system here and a system there, and so on, so on. So, it's amazing. I mean, it's so many chances. I mean, the internet, at and problem, the, the, all the new technology coming available, power becoming cheaper, and they having free, but not huge... Easy. So, no, no, no. so, I mean, I'll but... Give, I'll give you a few little stories. So, I actually went on the plane, I flew to Tokyo with the, with the uh, boxes, yeah. right? I didn't ship them FedEx. They, they were like my luggage, right? And the funny thing was that my, I, I used a vendor, a software vendor, to work because I needed custom Dialogic interface. Dialogic doesn't route their call over IP. So I, I had to change the Dialogic firmware to write to a specific port. And for that, I hired a team to do it. And I was already on my way to Japan and these guys basically wanted more money. They were like threatening me. They were like, we're not going to activate your boxes if you don't pay us more money. And I'm like, by the time I land in Japan, if you are not uh, uh, activating these boxes, I'm gonna go on national TV and tell the world that AT&T could and the State Department could not activate its services because, because of you, and I'm gonna name you as the person that blocked it. So uh, uh, the guy's name was Zarik something. He lives in New Jersey. So on record, still lives in New Jersey. Yes, and. Um, 
And his partner, Benoit Bolsé, who lives in Belgium, said, no worries, don't worry. Don't worry about what Zarek said. I'm going to activate the boxes for you. We're not going to let this thing fail. This is a, we're making history here, you know? So, uh, so and the funny thing that AT&T Gens was inside the KDD building in Japan. So when you fly to Japan, you go from Narita to Tokyo, there's a giant building that has no windows, and that's the KDD headquarters. And ATT Gens was one floor of that. And KDD is, is I know entity, I know entity Docomo, but I mean, what is KDD? Entity is like the local carrier, and KDD was the international carrier. They were the KPN, the international provider. They had the exclusive rights for any voice communication. So, so they were extremely happy to see you because they really loved the project, not. Exactly. So they they wanted to know what these boxes were and everything else, and I was like, it's voicemail systems. You know, it's just we're just putting a voicemail for AT and T, right? And they had no clue what we did, right? But when we installed it and connected and tested and, and went live, it was in the New York Times the next day. It was AT and T launches services in Japan, bypassing KDD. And all of that was done just to renegotiate the, the termination rate. The, the project wasn't about voice over IP or technology or anything. They wanted to have leverage, and they actually lowered the termination rate to $1.50 from $3, and by that compressed dramatically what we paid Japan. And the same. And the, and the system from you never got into production. Well, it it was in production for several years, okay. so they used it. But it wasn't the reason wasn't really that they wanted to bypass. They were they wanted to have leverage against. Uh, what about all these other countries? So we did that all over the world in Korea with BT in England with K KPM was one of my best customers. You know, so all over Europe, all over the world we. Eventually, but after a while, everybody knew that, so they hated. They must have hated you because they knew that AT and T was going to renegotiate. It was basically, you know, you were burning money for them. Yeah, so so it was kind of like, but the, the, you know, when you open Pandora box and you let the stuff out, you can't put it back in the box. So suddenly there was all this business of bypass telecom services, the gray market. We used to they could do it the same, and all the telcos could do it with everybody else. Anybody can do it. Anyone could come to AT&T, buy circuits from them, right? Buy internet uh, access, make local phone calls. We were very cheap and bypass AT&T itself, right? So suddenly there were thousands of carriers and that's why Arbinet was an, uh, the name was arbitrary network. You could use any network you wanted to come in and get out, and we built a clearing system for 4,000 carriers. We had 4,000 carriers as customers, wow. and we cleared all the transaction. It didn't matter if the transaction was TDM or VoIP, we could terminate anything to anything. What a fantastic place to be in. Hey, and how, how did the funding go? Uh, at what point did you get what level of funding? Because totally you did about 300 million, but how was it built up? Yeah, we, we raised over 300 million. Uh, the first round, it was, it was the funniest round that Actually, there's a Harvard business case about Arbinet getting the A round. Uh, this was a $12 million uh, raise. And so was that after you proved to AT&T that it worked? I mean, did you do before yeah, that? We had, we had revenues. I think we had something like $20 million in revenues. Oh. And, and we were break even or maybe a little bit profitable. But the main thing was that I had three term sheets. So I got three term sheets from three different companies. And I chose the lowest term sheet. I chose the term sheet that actually gave me the lowest valuation, not the highest valuation. And that's why Harvard wanted to do a business case about it because they were like, "Your first time entrepreneur, why wouldn't you take the highest valuation?" And I and I chose the lowest. I took yeah. Wh why, why wouldn't you take, you the, take the highest? Why, why did you take the lowest? Yeah. And the reason was that the investors behind the lowest valuation were the most reputable investors, mm -hmm. and because of that, because they invested in that A round, I got a B round and a C round, and then all the way to an F. So it went stop. But how did you get from to 20 million? Because you need it, just you need money. Moment. It was just basically doing it yourself. Running through it myself. We we had something like uh, I think 45 employees. We were above a disco on on 52nd uh, Street, uh, 226 East 52nd Street, 54th Street. Sorry, it was it, it was Studio 54. <laughs> and and but you basically did it on your own. You yeah. buy just doing projects for everybody yes. and just yes. And we were deploying deploying uh, voice over IP systems and callback systems and all kind of other systems for everybody. I was, I was the switch provider. I, I actually made systems for all these guys. And then we started reselling access as well. So people could come to us and actually buy access from all the other carriers that we had. 
And so, in what steps did you first had 12 million, and then how did the steps go up? What was and what was the last? What was the last deal? So we we had uh, I think the the first round was 12 million. Then we raised something like 30, and then we raised 60 at like something like 800 million dollar valuation. That was 2000. So right during the hype. Because because uh, 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 CSFB Franco Tron agreed to take us public at like a billion six valuation in two thousand in two thousand and then everything and because basically investors came in at a fifty percent uh, uh, discount mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, you know obviously everything collapsed in two thousand we missed the window but we ended up going public in two thousand and four. And we were the best. Much more company. solid, much more solid, because you had yeah. revenue, you had profit. Yes, yes. By, by 2004, we were also the only uh, guys left standing. Uh, so we were, we were by then doing something like 3 or 4% of the world's traffic uh, when we were, uh, went public, right? So managing 3 or 4% of all the world's traffic. And um, the funny part was that... that um, uh, in 2001, when the when the tower collapsed, uh, uh, we were th the main switches for the eastern uh, shore were in the World Trade, and then there was a Verizon switch also that was right next to the World Trade, and all of them went down. So our system at 75 Broad Street was one of the only remaining, and the, the so you and BlackBerry. The FBI sent uh, people to protect our building because they wanted to make sure that, because if they took us out, uh, half of the United States wouldn't be able to make any outbound phone calls. Wow. So suddenly you were 30% of we were, the... I remember the switches, we had at and Nortel, uh, we had Nortel switches and they were running at 100, the clock was at 120% utilization the whole time. It was just cranking, like, uh, you know, we, we, we made as much as we could. And I remember we were running on diesel because we, there was no power south of 14th Street. And I, I remember going and talking to the FBI about bringing a diesel truck. And they're like, you're not getting a diesel truck through the, through the barriers because, uh, you know, so, so it was just great, crazy times. But it was a great time to learn. It was a great time to invent these technologies. And um, today we all take it for granted, right? VoIP is built into everything. But back then, that was... It was a big transition. And also, the voice quality was sucked. Like, yeah, there was no demand. It was really it bad. Yeah. We had to compress it so much yeah. that uh, as bandwidth became more and more available, people st stopped compressing. So, like, Skype and WhatsApp don't compress the quality at all. So, it's, that's why the quality is so good, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, then, in that time, you also grew from 45 people, from, from 0 to 45, and then from 45 to, at the highest point before you left, how many people were there? Yeah, I think we had like 370, something like that. Uh, Still yeah. very small. And how much yeah. was the sales in that moment? We had uh, sales in uh, billions of dollars because we, we, we uh, again, we cleared transactions oh, yeah. for billions, for 4,000 carriers. So, the total volume was. Uh, yeah, but your margin, your margin of that was, uh, your margin was small. So how much, how much was your own revenue? Net revenue again, we were public companies, so our net revenues was something like 150 million or something like that. So a million a person, not bad. What about your role? I mean, what what role do you play in companies? And when they become bigger, it becomes a pain to run them. You have to be different. So what is your sweet spot, and how do you, how do you create a team? So like you, I, I like the zero to a hundred people. I think uh, that is the most fun. Every person matters, every day matters, every task matters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like to come up with the idea, I like to pull together the core team, experiment, figure out what the right way, and then uh, scale it, right? Grow it fast. And uh, sometimes it works magically well. Like Arbinet was just, we were just rocking, right? Uh, we were doing great, we were winning against all of our competitors. Because everybody tried to copy us within within a year or two, everybody was like, "Oh, that's a great idea. Let's do exactly the same thing." And uh, but we already had the key customers, right? We had the very large carriers already transacting with us. You had trust, and we had trust. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because AT and T, even though they were like our first project, when they saw that we started giving it to everybody else, they're like, "Hey, stop right there. We just did this because we had to." do it for the State Department, but we don't, want, we don't want everybody to have this stuff. Why are you giving it to everybody? And we're like, no, you don't understand. This is everybody in the, in the planet is going to be able to use this. 
right? It was the beginning of the end. Uh, but what role do you play? Are you still the yeah. CEO? Do you still the weekly meetings? Or how does it work? Yeah, so I don't have patience uh, uh, for detail. So I usually hire someone to replace me as a CEO. Like in Arbanet, I was running it from basically 94 through 2000. And uh, I had a great CEO who replaced me and, and uh, took the company public. I was still on the board. I was still a major shareholder, investor. Yeah. And, uh, but I did not run the day to day. I was already busy with the next idea, you know, so. Yeah, so you so slowly yeah. moved out and slowly other people took over. And are these CEOs uh, in the end, are they still your friends? I mean, or because it's difficult to let your baby go and you are basically not going to agree on everything. How does that work out? So, look, it depends. I mean, I think uh, when CEOs, uh, hired CEOs, hired guns, usually are not the idea people, right? Usually they are just guys that know how to run things yeah. very methodically. They can squeeze every last penny of profits out of the system. That's what not what I'm focused on. I'm focused on solving big problems, right? How do you get voice of IP to work? Yeah. So how what do happens you with your relationship with the CEO? What happens is you sit on a board, there is usually eight or 12 or whatever, as many board members, and, and you have one voice. And, and uh, you either convince everybody that uh, they have to listen to you or you don't. In Arbinet's case, uh, I could not convince the board that uh, I thought the company was going in the wrong direction. And eventually the company uh, fumbled and uh, lost customers, lost market share because they did not continue to innovate, right? There were because when you run a public company, you have to balance innovation versus delivering profits to your shareholders. Yeah. And the CEO we had was very good at delivering the profits, but he did not innovate. And when you don't innovate, you allow other people to, to leapfrog you. Yeah. And you were not inside the company anymore. Then when you had the CEO uh, replace you, you also stopped going there daily and doing some kind of, you could have done the innovation task or something like that. More than that, I ran a proxy to replace the CEO. So I actually went and convinced the shareholders to vote for me to replace the CEO. So they voted me back in oh. to do a restructuring and it was front page in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I think 2007 or something like that. So about 12 years after, uh, just like Steve Jobs, I think he came back 13 years later to run Apple. Yeah. But in this case, uh, things didn't work out the way I wanted. I was actually trying to take the company private and that didn't work out and long story. But the bottom line is, is again, it's like your child. It's like seeing your child. You have to let it go and yes. sometimes things happen yes. with it. Okay, so great story about Voice of IP. There's many more stories, I think, but that's about it. We're now going to New York and to the Wi-Fi in the, in the um, subway system, which is great. And then we're going to Celsius.